scenario where Andy Reid might say, all right, um, you sit him against the Vikings and you bring him back against Tennessee and then they're at L.A. and then you are got your bye week and then you're home against the Raiders instead of kind of throwing him into the fire. This is just coming from a biased Viking fan that doesn't want to see him. But just uh, tell us, um, tell us, give us an update on Mahomes and how do you think Andy Reid should and will handle this? Well, first of all, there there is no definitive answer to this. It's all speculation and guesswork. And so the, the, uh, what we know for sure is that the part of practice that we have access to, the media has access to, Matt Moore is taking snaps with the ones. So we're thinking that Matt Moore will, will start the game, will play the game, and they'll, and they'll sit Patrick Mahomes for a, for a second straight game. And that, um, I, I think that, that if that happens, I think that would be the smart move because in addition to the knee that he injured against the Broncos two weeks ago that's created this absence, the ankle that he hurt in the opener and re-aggravated twice after that in losses to the Colts and the Texans now gets more time to heal. So I think best-case scenario for the Chiefs is they sit Patrick Mahomes this week as well, and and then the first time they, they would consider strongly consider bringing him back would be – the following week, the week 10 game at the Tennessee Titans for the Chiefs. And listen, if we're up to me, the way the way the AFC West is unfolding is bad right, right. The, the rest of the division is, I would, my tendency, my, my temptation would be to sit Patrick Mahomes this week, next week, and even in Mexico City, the week 11 game at the, against the Chargers on Monday Night Football, and the Chiefs have a bye week after that, and I'd bring them back until December. Um, but uh, I don't think that's the way the Chiefs are going to play it. I do think Mahomes sits this week plays the following week and so um yeah get ready for a little matt moore in the uh <laughs> in, in, in the game in the game this week and that's a fantastic point on your part just to you know a lot of times you just look at patrick mahomes oh get him back as quick as possible but then you kind of say all right look it's november and then you have to look at where you are in terms of in the division the afc west no offense i mean the Raiders are three and four. The Chargers are three and five, and I think the Broncos are two and six. I mean, this is a situation where, I mean, I, I know that home field is a priority, but you have to assume that New England is just is going. You're going to have to go to New England and beat them in their house, which I, which is I think what you want to do after last year. Um, but I agree with you. I, this, is, this is your franchise guy. You, you don't want to hurry him back and you know miss out on a uh, on a full season or whatever it may be. So I agree with you. Let's talk about Matt Moore. What will this offense look like? Obviously, it's a huge difference. But listen, Andy Reid is an innovative offensive genius. Give me some insight on what this offense might look like on Sunday. You know, I will. It, it'll look like. Um, it'll look a little bit like it did on Sunday night against the Packers, only I think a little bit less so because I think the Vikings have a better defense than Green Bay. But Matt Moore will have now, now, ha- now has a game under his belt and another week of practice with the ones, and that'll um, that'll help him. Maybe it'll end up being a wash. Although, look, I'm, I have total respect for Minnesota's defense. It is one of the better ones in the NFL. But I think what you'll see is a more of a – uh, game management approach and less of an ad lib approach is what, uh, what the Chiefs fans have gotten used to under Patrick Mahomes. Mahomes, one of his greatest strengths besides his strong arm is his ability to extend plays with his, you know, improvisation, you know, the way he can, uh, weave behind, you know, as he, as, as people are pursuing him, he did the, 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 the routes he takes to avoid sacks and to create, you know, wonderful plays. It's, it's just amazing. It's, haven't seen anything quite like it. We've seen elusive quarterbacks in the NFL, but I don't think we've seen one who can be as elusive as Mahomes and then come up with a pinpoint accurate pass on the other end. And he's done that time and again, time and again, and just um, is just a marvel at that. So eliminate that possibility with Matt Moore. That just doesn't exist. So it's going to have to be more scripted, more game management. And for Chiefs fans, it's going to. It's going to be more like the, the Alex Smith Chiefs than the Patrick mm. Mahomes Chiefs. Um, and look, Moore had some nice numbers last week. He was 24 36 for 267, two touchdowns, one of which was one of those jet sweeps where the ball was in the air for a millisecond. Um, but, he, but he did throw a nice, uh, you know, under pressure, under duress, threw, threw a nice touchdown pass to Travis Kelsey. And, um, and, and so, look, he, gets a, he, he got a good grade from me in that game, a solid B. 
And if, I think the Chiefs would take that. Uh, they would absolutely take those numbers against this defense they're going to see this week. And we're here with Blair Kirkoff from the Kansas City Star. I agree with you. I, I thought that Matt Moore actually played a really nice game. And, um, you know, I just thought that at the end of the day, the defense needed to make stops, and they didn't. That screen pass really burnt them at the end of the game. Uh, let's flip. Let's flip to the other side. Let's go to the Vikings here. Last four games, I mean, uh, I know I talked about it on your podcast, but they have been lighting it up offensively. I just did the numbers, 127 points in the last four games, which is 31 points per game. What's the biggest difference you think you've seen from this Vikings offense from the beginning of the year to these last four games? Well, certainly, uh, you know, Kirk Cousins has the best uh, passer rating in the NFL over those four games, second best overall anyway right now, right, behind Russell Wilson. and Correct. Um, Look, this is the this is the best he's but this is the best stretch of his career. I saw a great stat on him uh, after after the game last weekend, where you know he is now um, over five hundred for the first time in his career as a starting quarterback since he was one and zero. So I mean that that's, that tells you that's a combination of the, the teams and the, and the offenses that he had you know that he had surrounding him and and, uh, and and his ability as well, but. I, I've always thought that Kirk Cousins was a very capable quarterback, a playoff-level quarterback, and he's been even more than that here in the last month. Listen, I will say the um, the, the Vikings have not defeated a team that is currently that currently has a winning record over the last month, but that win over the Eagles was just lights out good, and um, and 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 the you know the, the production they're getting not only from Dalvin Cook but um, but but Diggs and. Um, and, and, and the rookie running back, uh, Madison, I mean, they're, they're just getting contributions from, from everybody. On the defensive side, look, they, uh, the, the, the two ends, Hunter is just fantastic. And uh, I, I think they're going to cause a lot of problems for the Chiefs on, on Sunday. Um, having said all that, having said all that, I, I do think the Chiefs have an, have an opportunity with Matt Moore, with Tyreek Hill and Demarcus Robinson and Sammy Watkins on the uh, – you know, at wide receiver to take advantage of the Vikings' cornerback play. I think Correct. they're a little soft here in the you know this season overall, and I, I think that's where the Chiefs will try to exploit the Vikings. I think where the Vikings need to exploit the Chiefs is in the middle of the field. The Chiefs linebackers have been uh, they're the weak link on their defense this season. Well, it's funny. I was just going to ask you, but you answered the question. I was going to say, where where is basically? I wanted to look at the matchups really quickly, and where do you think the Chiefs have the biggest advantage, and vice versa? So you think that Casey's outside wide receivers have the advantage? That's the biggest one um, with the Vikings corners, and then the linebackers for Casey versus uh, the Vikings running backs. Correct? Yeah, absolutely. Look what uh, the. the um... Aaron Jones just went crazy last week. 159 yards receiving, 67 rushing. Chiefs linebackers couldn't be couldn't keep up with him. It was it was illustrative. <clears throat> at the um, when the Packers had the ball with a seven point lead um, at the end of the game because the Chiefs had decided to punt to them on a fourth and three from the 40 with five minutes to go. The Chiefs thought they could get the ball back, but on the critical play, a, a third and three. Um, the, the uh, Aaron, Aaron Rodgers just sent his sent his running back out wide because he knew he'd be isolated with a linebacker, and and the Packers picked up an easy first down, and that was the ball game. They were able to uh, victory formation from from that uh, that point forward. Uh, the Chiefs linebackers have just been the soft spot on this defense. It's been a really nice year, a really nice bounce back year for the secondary up front. They've been playing really well in Steve Spagnuolo's four uh, three. But it's in the middle that uh, that I think there is opportunity for all opponents. Now, having said all that, this is also a Chiefs defense that's come up with 14 sacks in the last two games. Right. They have they have put teams in third and long situations. It's been the best part of it, 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 defensively. Even though they gave up 31 to the Packers, they actually played a pretty decent game uh, defensively. They just couldn't get. They were tired. They've been on the field a long time. They could not get the ball back at the end of the game. So. I do think that um, I, I think we're going to see a lot of cook in the middle, a lot of cook at uh, you know catching the ball out of the backfield, and, uh, and and on the other side, I think I think the Vikings are going to have to pay real close attention to Tyree Kill and to uh, and to Sammy Watkins. 
And I agree with the defense. Look, you know, as much as they gave up their 31 points, they make plays. You got to give them credit. I mean, they, you know, they create, they create kind of chaos in terms of getting sacks and turning balls uh, over. So got to give the Kansas City Chiefs some credit there. Last one before we let you go. Let's get away from football really quickly. I want to talk about Andrew Wiggins because you covered him out of Kansas and the Timberwolves signed him to a massive five-year, $147 million contract. Should we give up on Andrew Wiggins? Give me some insight here on Wiggy and if you still believe in this guy. You know, I'll, I'll just give you my impressions of him when he was at Kansas. He, it, was a, it was quite a recruiting coup for Kansas. Wiggins was a late signee and, and easily the best, not only the best player probably of his class, but the best player – um, uh, the best player available and the best player in his class because he signed like in April. It was a it was a late signing and the, the Kansas fans were just beside themselves that the Jayhawks had had landed this guy. And then you know he comes in and 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 does what you thought he might do as a freshman. He fills it up. He you know he runs the floor really well. You could tell he was a even though he was a freshman, he was a, a next level player among right. college players. But but. You know, when when it came time to take over games, he, he demurred a little bit. And there were a couple of games. He had a game at West Virginia where he scored 41. I always thought that was part of that was because that was, it went back to his high school uh, Huntington Prep uh, state and, uh, and 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 kind of had some people in the stands. But he, you know, he, there were times when he disappeared. NCAA, Kansas's NCAA tournament loss that year was Johnny Dawkins Stanford team, um, and and Wiggins had six points. Uh, if there was ever a time, and this was a Stanford team that wasn't special, they didn't go into the Final Four or anything, uh, but they showed a little bit of attention, paid a little bit of attention to to Andrew Wiggins and shut him down. So, anyway, from a college standpoint, he was everything that Kansas hoped he would be. He was an All Conference player, Freshman of the Year, led the team in scoring, um, but but couldn't carry the team to the level that Kansas fans thought a guy who was going to go overall number one. Uh, could take them. And listen, he played on a team that year that Frank Mason was a freshman, the, the guy who went on to become national player of the year. And, yep. um, and, and, um, uh, so he had some, Wayne Seldon was on that team. There, there were some players, he had some teammates that were future NBA players, but Wiggins wasn't a, a, enough to get Kansas past, I think it was a 25 or 26 win team at, at a program that's used to winning 30, 31 games a year. Um, I hope he has a good pro career. He seems like a good guy. Um, uh, you know, I just, I just kind of, I've always kind of wondered how, how his game fits in today's NBA. <laughs> Man, Blair is on the money today. I mean, he could definitely relate to everything that he just said in terms of big games and big moments. Where's Wiggy? And he kind of just. Uh, and the frustrating part is, and we'll end really quickly here, the frustrating part is you know he's got the talent. And you talked about the West Virginia game. Well, if the the Timberwolves play Oklahoma City, I don't know what it is with Oklahoma City and Andrew Wiggins. I mean, the stats are, it, it, they just inflate to no end. I've, n- I've never seen it. So um, I could definitely relate to that. But, uh, Blair, I really appreciate you coming on today. Tremendous job. He is the reporter for the Kansas City Star. He writes some great stuff. I was reading them all week leading up to the game. Make sure you check him out on Twitter, at Blair Kirkhoff. I'll spell the last name really quickly. K-E-R-K-H-O-F-F. Blair, enjoy the game. Have a great day. And I appreciate you for uh, giving me some time today. Steve, I really enjoyed it. Great talking to you a couple times this week. You take care, and let's do it again uh, when when Minnesota and Kansas City hook up in some uh, competitions. Uh, maybe it's February. You never know. There you go. <laughs> All right. Have, have, a, good, have a good one. Good one. And a big thanks to Blair Kirkhoff for coming on and giving me some time. Great stuff. I was also on his podcast. Check it out on Twitter at Blair Kirkhoff. You can go on his Twitter. I'm, I actually was just on his podcast on Wednesday, so we kind of returned the favor. Okay. I wanted to get into some po- this is a positive show today, okay? Top three most underpaid athletes in Minnesota. Let's cue the music here. And this was an interesting list that I was trying to come up with for you guys today. Um, you know, I was looking at base salaries and I was looking at yearly salaries, and I'm doing this out of 2019. So I know some of the guys on this list are going to get paid in the future, but I just wanted to go over the list and and once again this is just based on 2019 okay so number three on this list yes i understand he just got it signed and extended but for this year this man adam thielen 
is making eight hundred and five thousand dollars on his base salary. Okay, this is just football strictly. I understand he's making money outside of football. Adam Thielen's got to be number three on this list. He's got a new contract that kicks in in 2020, but his base salary is $805,000. That is unbelievable for being a top five, top ten wide receiver in this league. Look.